the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful. We give him praise and thanks for his mercy to the human family in the form of divine guidance, revealing more and more of himself and his nature through the mouth and revelation of himself to his prophets and messengers. We thank him for Musa or Moses and the Torah. We thank him for Esau, Jesus, and the Quran. We thank him for Muhammad, peace be upon these worthy servants and the Holy Quran. I am a student of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and I personally give praise and thanks to Allah for his mercy to us and his intervention in our affairs. In the person of Master W. Farad Muhammad, the Mahdi, who came among us and raised from among us one to lead, teach, and guide us in the person of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I greet all of you, my dear and wonderful brothers and sisters, visitors and friends, with the greeting words of peace. Assalamu alaikum. I am honored and thankful to Allah for the privilege of standing before you to bear witness to the majesty of Allah the greatness of Allah, the mercy of Allah, the power of Allah, the protection of Allah, and the wisdom that Allah reveals to his servants that we may become what he created us to be. To those of you who are here for your first time, You have heard of the Nation of Islam. You have heard of Louis Farrakhan, perhaps. And you have heard that we are Muslims. And some of you wonder when you drive by the street whether you would be welcome, particularly if you feel you are not Muslim. But every one of you is a Muslim. It's just that some know it and some do not know it. Islam is considered a religion, but Islam is more than a religion. Islam is the nature of God and the nature in which he created humanity. Islam is a world that encompasses everything that goes for human development. So when someone says to you, I am a Muslim, they are saying, I believe in surrendering my will entirely to do the will of God. That is not a bad name. That is the most noble name or title that one could have. Some of us want to be big shots, and, and that's natural, I guess. Imagine to be president. Imagine to be king, imagine to be emperor, imagine to be foreign minister or minister of state. These are great titles. But I never read in the Holy Quran where it says, die not unless you die the death of a president. <laughs> die not unless you die the death of a king or an emperor or a minister or an imam. 
The Quran says, die not unless you die the death of a Muslim. So the greatest title that any human being could have is the title of Muslim. And Muslim is not a title as such. It is an indication of the nature in which God created you. So when I say I'm a Muslim, I'm not following an Arab religion. Although Islam in its present form came to the world through Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah, peace be upon him, and through that nation that is called Arabia, but it was not in the Prophet's mind as Arabia. What was in the Prophet's mind was what was the answer and fulfillment of the prayer of Abraham. When Abraham and Ishmael rebuilt the foundation of the house, Al-Haram, the Kaaba, the sacred house, Al-Bayt Allah, the house of Allah, the most ancient house of worship to be found anywhere on the earth. Abraham and Ishmael rebuilt the foundation of that house, and when they finished, they made a prayer to Allah, and they asked Allah to accept their work and make them Muslims and raise from among their offspring a nation of Muslims. So when the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, came into the world and received the final revelation that would come to the world that would lead us all the way up to and through the judgment of the world, the Quran, Prophet Muhammad never considered any other nation but a nation of Muslims, human beings, from whatever race, whatever tribe, whatever color, whatever ethnic origin, that was secondary. This nation would be a nation of human beings bound by their belief in the oneness of God, their belief in all of his prophets, making no distinction with any of them, belief in all of the revelations that he ever sent into the world through his prophets, and the final revelation, which is Quran, and based on this belief in the judgment of the world, the hereafter, the angels, principles of action, prayer, charity, hajj, pilgrimage to the holy house at least once in our lifetime, jihad, or the struggle of the human being against any force of evil within himself, in the society, or in the world. Therefore, no man can say or woman can say, I am a Muslim living in a world of rebellion and at peace with such a world. If you say you are Muslim and you are at peace with a world that is in abject or diametric disobedience to God, then you are not a Muslim. You have compromised your faith for peace with those who are the enemies of God. Of course, of course you are a Muslim, but you are not practicing. And if we do not practice what our nature is, it is considered like burying it or veiling it. None of us can claim to love Allah and love his prophets and especially claim to love Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and be at peace in a world like this. 
You cannot walk by an ignorant person and be at peace. Your job, your mission is to bring the light of knowledge to everyone who is struggling to come out of the darkness of ignorance. It is your duty to fight against oppression, either with your hands or with your tongue or by rejecting it, but you must do something to let the world know you disapprove of the evil that is being perpetrated against the people. Whether we want to admit it or not, if we are Muslims, we are soldiers. I'm going to say it again. If we are Muslims, we are soldiers. And if we're soldiers, what army are we in? You can't be a soldier in the army of the infidel. You can't be a soldier fighting for the political ends of corrupt leadership. You are a soldier in the army of Allah, the Most High. Therefore, you fight differently. You don't fight to take the land of another or the wealth of another and claim it as yours because you overcame those weaker than yourself. As a Muslim, you fight for the cause of righteousness over wickedness, freedom over slavery, justice over injustice, equality over inequality, truth over falsehood, light over darkness, right over wrong. Every one of us is a soldier. And as the Christians say, onward, Christian soldiers. Well, it doesn't look like we are at war if we have compromised with a world that is at variance with God. This is a world governed by the power of Satan. How then can you be at peace until this world is dispatched, until this world is removed and its power to deceive is destroyed, until this world is replaced with a government run by Allah and the laws of God bringing about peace on earth and goodwill and fellowship between all the members of the human family until that government is established. You cannot be at peace. Some of us are happy because the temporal powers accept us. Some of us are happy because we have a good job in a contrary world. Some of us are happy because we are Muslims or Christians and there is no struggle, you know. I don't quite understand how you could be a good Christian or a good Muslim and not be involved in a struggle. And so today, my first appearance at the mosque or masjid since 
our Savior's Day, our wonderful Savior's Day convention. which beheld the beginning steps of reconciliation between the members of the Nation of Islam and Imam Waratuddin Muhammad and really our world of Islam. Today, I want to talk to you about why the nation of Islam has taken this amount of time to reconcile with our world of Islam. Don't you think that we did not desire unity with our world of Islam we did don't you think that we did not love our world of Islam for we passionately do but I want to inshallah if it be the will of Allah talk to you today about why the nation of Islam in the West was established in the way it was. And I want you to bear with me because I have great Muslims in front of me, scholars in front of me, great followers of the Holy Prophet Muhammad in front of me, former followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, who now follow Prophet Muhammad and are happy over their growth. If I may today, I want you to see by the grace of Allah what is in my heart, what is in my mind, and let's try to see what was in the heart and the mind of Master Farad Muhammad, what was in the heart and the mind of Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and what is in our heart and mind today. Beloved Christians and Muslims, I want you to bear with me as I go through this I hope it's not long, but I, I, I want to deal with this because the greatest thing you can share with people is not just knowledge, not just wisdom, but understanding. We may know the same thing, but we may understand it differently. And if we have different perception of reality, then we could be on the same page and not know it, or we could be at variance with each other in our lack of understanding. But if understanding comes to us, understanding is the key that unites different I would say factors that have the same answer. If your mother taught you that five and two is seven, and my mother taught me that six and one is seven, and your mother taught you that three and four are seven, and your mother taught you that seven plus zero is seven, when we meet, we will argue with each other because I was taught how to get to seven different from the way you were taught. But if we understood basic arithmetic, 
we would know that we all were saying the same thing. And, and this is why And this is why one of the prophets said, get wisdom. Wisdom is the principal thing. But with all that getting, be sure you get understanding. To understand Farad Muhammad and Elijah Muhammad is not easy for our brothers and sisters in the world of Islam. And for us to say we love these two men, Farad Muhammad and Elijah Muhammad, when the world saw at least Elijah Muhammad, because they didn't know Farad Muhammad, as somebody that was not quite hitting the mark. But they admired his work. They admit Elijah Muhammad was the most successful in transforming the life of so-called American Negroes. And although many Muslims from the East who loved us wanted to bring us Islam, their method never reached us. And in truth, they never could have reached us with their methodology. And wait now, if, if they could have, they would have. It took a special skill to get to the black man and woman of America in the condition that was imposed upon us by our former slave masters and their children. Special skill. Now you may say, we didn't need what Farad Muhammad brought. We could have just learned of the beauty of our religion by following the Sunnah of the Prophet and the understanding of the Quran as the scholars of Islam have given it. I say with all due respect, I beg to differ with you. And here's my reason. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, three generations after me will no longer be of me. I didn't say it. He said it. If a generation is 20 years and three generations is 60 years, then in less than 100 years, even though Islam conquered the known world from the 7th to the 11th century, yet the Prophet said, three generations after me will no longer be of me. What does that of me mean? I am not an Arabic scholar at all. I, I really can't read it and I can't write it. But Allah never raised anybody except that he speaks the language of those to whom he is sent. And so uh, my brothers and sisters don't know Arabic either. But that doesn't mean I'm disqualified in representing Allah, even if I'm ignorant, unlearned in the Arabic language. It means I should learn it. I should learn it. And maybe Allah will bless me one day to learn it. 
But since you know it and I don't, some of you, then you tell me if my English is not in harmony with your understanding of Arabic. <laughs> now, if the Holy Prophet said, and he did say it, three generations after me will no longer be of me. That of is a preposition in English that denotes possession, something internal. We will be Muslims on the outside, but we will not be possessed of the spirit of that man to whom Allah revealed Quran. And I say to you, beloved followers of Christianity or Islam or Judaism, to be of Jesus is to be imbued with the spirit out of which Jesus did what he did. To be of Muhammad is to be imbued with the spirit out of which Muhammad accomplished the impossible. He took ignorant Arabs who were divided. He cleansed them by the power of Allah. He transformed their lives. He united them into a nation and he set them on a course that would ultimately bring them to become the power in the world. But he also knew that something would happen to his beloved community. And 80 days before he passed from among us, he said to his followers, There is no superiority of the white over the black or the Muslim over the non-Muslim. But the best of you is not the blackest or the whitest or the richest or the wisest. The best of you, he said, is the one most careful of his or her duty to God. The most pious, the most righteous among you. Then he said, if you follow this Quran and my sunnah, my example, the way I lived this book. If you follow that, you will never deviate. You will never deviate. You will never lose the path that I put you on. But the prophet knew that his community would deviate. How did he know this? This book Quran says, Shaitan and Allah are having a conversation. And Shaitan, or, or the enemy of God, or Satan, is saying to God, because you have caused me to remain disappointed and judged me erring. I will lie in wait for them. Them who? Your servants. In Sirat al-Mustaqim. 
in the straight path, in your straight path, God. I'm going to be right in the straight path and I'll come to your servants from before them, from behind them, from their left side, from their right side. I'll make all of them deviate. And Allah said to Shaitan, whosoever follows you, I will certainly fill hell with you all. And then in another place he said, you will get all except my purified ones. Now this is very important because purified ones. This is the past participle of the verb to purify, to cleanse. And it's not that you have the power to cleanse yourself but it's someone outside of you acting upon you out of love for you that purifies you that you could be considered his elect. You'll get all except my purified ones. All right, I'm going to move quickly. This book, Quran, woke up sleeping Europe. And it caused a renaissance among the European people. This book, Quran, gave us a new culture. Not Arab culture, not Pakistani culture, not African culture, not Native American culture, but a culture coming from a new knowledge that would unify humanity under one culture, the culture of Islam, the culture that derives from our obedience to this book the culture that comes from obedience to his sunnah. And we mistake sunnah for beard. We mistake sunnah for the length of a jalebiya. We mistake sunnah for the way the prophet ate with his hands. We mistake sunnah for things that are very irrelevant unimportant and we become like those people in the time of Jesus that strain at a gnat and swallow a camel because we're more concerned about whether my ring is gold or it is silver because if it is silver, I'm following the prophet. You look past principles that undergird everything that the prophet said and everything that the prophet did. It is these principles that are immutable. He used the mishwak. Today there's a toothbrush. The principle is clean your teeth. He rode on a camel. The principle is get a means of transportation to get around. If we have automobiles and airplanes today, why hang around with a camel? What is wrong with Islam? What has happened to this noble, beautiful world of ours? Islam has become a stagnant thing. 
that is more a slave making doctrine than a doctrine that frees you to go onward and upward in the eternal quest of knowledge. I have been in mosques in Africa on Salatul Juma, and the Imam read one of the kutbahs of Ali, 1400 years old. Great kutbah, but does it relate specifically? to the needs of the ummah or the community today? What is the matter with you? You say we should learn the Quran by heart and become Hafiz, yes. But is it not better to practice the wonderful principles found in this book than to know it all by heart and do nothing about it? The Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, said that a jackass, if you put a book on the back of the jackass and he climbs up the mountain, when he gets to the top of the mountain, he's still a jackass because he doesn't know what's in the book. So to quote the book, doesn't impress me to say it from cover to cover does not impress me but to live this book so that you can make an impact on the world that impresses me. Well, wait now, I'm, I, I haven't got to my main point yet. The Holy Prophet saw racism among his companions. That's why he said, there's no superiority of the white over the black because evidently some had that attitude that because I'm white I'm better than my black brother who is a Muslim. The prophet saw racism poisoning the bloodstream of religion. He saw some of us would think because we are Muslims, we are better than the non-Muslim. In one sense, yes. Because if you're carrying into practice the principles of your faith, you should be acting better than one who is not practicing. But to let that give you the false attitude that you are in fact better, then that sets up the beginning of the mentality of Iblis or Shaitan when you think because of some characteristic that sets you apart from somebody else that that in fact makes you better than that person. When you think like that, then you take advantage of people you think you're better than. You mistreat people that you think you're better than. You think the law is for them but not for you because you're better. You impose your way on others. This brings us to Arab imperialism in the name of Islam.
white folks, a Jewish scholar, wrote a book on racism in Islam. Naturally, it upsets Muslims because we all claim, oh no, there is no color distinction in Islam. There is not that at all. Islam believes that all people are equal in the sight of God. Don't that sound good? And that is exactly what Islam is, but what is your practice? I was in Kuwait one day, and I visited the office of Al-Kaf. That is an office that dispenses with charity to the various Islamic groups and causes in the world. So I thought maybe they would be interested in helping us. So as I sat before my young Kuwaiti brother, he came in with his beautiful white uh, garment and his headpiece, and he kept flinging it, you know. He looked something like Diana Ross with, with long hair, you know. And I sat in front of the brother, and in came an African to serve us coffee. And he served us beautiful Arabic coffee. And this man proceeded to talk to us in such an arrogant way till I just whipped him. Just beat him up. Because I don't believe that I should be a whore for your money. I don't give a damn about your money. My Allah is sufficient for me. And I don't have to beg or crawl or beg nobody for what Allah promised me and promised us if we believe. So I whipped the hell out of him and got up and walked out of the office. Later that evening, the African brother came to our hotel room. He had never heard anybody talk to them in that manner. He had a PhD degree from Al Azhar University. And the man that was sitting in front of me had not even a master degree, but the African with the big degree was serving me coffee and acting like a sycophant. And I ask myself and I ask all of you, if Islam is real in your life, how can you allow another human being to put you down because of a need that you have or a desire that you have? You let another human being humiliate you and yet you claim you're a servant of God. when I stand in the presence of kings and rulers and those that travel with me know I never back down from telling the truth as I understand it whether they like it or not because I don't give a damn for your position
I respect you as the king. I respect you as the president. I respect you as the prime minister. Because Allah says in the Quran, respect those in authority over you. But I will let nobody, nobody make a nuisance on or near my post and not call them on it. Now you may ask, Farrakhan, what is your post? See, I'm a soldier. And I know that as Muslims, we are at war. And if you don't recognize that we are at war, then you will never prepare yourself as a soldier to win in combat. It's not a physical confrontation right now. It's the battle for the minds and hearts of the people. We are supposed to be humble because humility is a characteristic of righteous people. But humility should never be taken for weakness or cowardice. I am a Muslim. My post is the Spirit of God that comes with being a Muslim trying to practice the principles of the religion or the faith knowing that Satan once he knows that I'm trying to be a servant of Allah is going to come at me from within myself and from outside of myself so I've got to be walking my post in a perfect manner keeping always on the alert observing everything within sight or hearing because I don't want to be robbed of my Islam I don't want some Satan either within myself or outside of myself to make me a passive Muslim. A passive Muslim is accepted by an unrighteous government because you are passive, you are no threat only potentially. Satan loves it when you pray five times a day and do nothing after you pray. Satan said, keep on praying. Satan loves it when you come to church singing the choir and then don't threaten his world. <laughs> Satan loves it when you observe the principles and you try to be good, but good for nothing. Because you refuse to recognize that the earth is a battlefield. And until the whole earth becomes a mosque, or a house of prayer to the worship of God, we have work to do. Satan loves passive Muslims, passive Christians. And the whole aim of the soldiers when they were fighting Geronimo and Cochise and the boys that wouldn't give up was to take the Indians and pacify them. Pacify them. Promise them peace on a reservation. 
and let them take the whole of the West and you just stay on your reservation and mind your business and we will get along fine. Muslims, stay in your mosque. Say your prayers. Quote the Holy Prophet. Just don't follow him. Because if you follow him, you're going to make trouble for me. And everyone that's trying to follow him and challenging the hegemony of the West is called an Islamic fundamentalist. I said, what's wrong with the fundamentals? If you don't practice the fundamentals of your faith, how could you be a good Christian or a good Muslim if you don't practice the fundamentals? But what they are arguing about is that they have pacified the moderates. They have pacified those who seek favors from America in exchange for pacification. We will recognize you. We will even speak well about you. As long as you accept pacification. Three generations after me will no longer be of me. And now our beautiful world of Islam lies in ruin. When you go among the members of the Jewish community who are white, they refer to the Arab as the dirty Arab. That's a heck of a name to put on us because the prophet gave us an example of cleanliness. He was clean. His quarters were clean. Whatever he had to wear was clean. His body was clean. No odor from his body. How could a dirty group of people claim the prophet in a mosque that is unclean? I want you to hear me. I went to the mosque at Al Azhar 20 years ago. And when I went into the mosque, I had to put on something to cover my shoes because you shouldn't walk in the mosque with your shoes on. But there, they had something to slip over your shoes. But there was so much dust in the mosque. When I put my forehead down, when I picked my forehead up, dirt was on my forehead. And when I looked at the chandeliers, spider webs on the chandeliers. And I said to the Imam, why do you have the house of Allah so dirty? And as Allah is my witness, this is his answer. He said, I wanted to keep it uh, the same way that it was 1,400 years ago in the time of the Holy Prophet. I wanted to strangle him. That's the truth. I wanted to rip his throat out because he not only lied, and tried to deceive me but then he wanted to put his dirt on the prophet I'm saying this to my Muslim family how in the hell can I follow you in a practice 
that got you dirty and you won't clean up your house, clean up your mosque, clean up your stores, clean up your neighborhood, clean up your country. I have been in the lounge in Cairo, Egypt, where all the heads of state and dignitaries come in. And I needed to go to the bathroom. And I had to hold myself for hours because fecal matter was in that toilet all the way up to the seat. I walked away. I was among heads of state and government, and they were giving me tea. And they gave me a glass, and I drank the tea. And when I put the glass down, as I had finished the tea, he poured tea in that glass and gave it to somebody else, oblivious to whether my lips were clean. How can I follow you? Why should I follow you when you have lost the spirit of the prophet himself and you are masquerading now as a Muslim on the outside but on the inside? You have denied the prophet. You have denied his way and you are not standing up for your Islam. Tell me I'm lying. Tell me I'm false. And I will sit down. Listen, listen, listen. I'm not putting our world down. I love our world of Islam. I praise Allah over and over for this wonderful, wonderful world. But my and your wonderful world of Islam is backward. And it must be brought into the modern time.